Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to our channel and thanks for logging on today. We have a throwdown between modern and vintage renditions of the classic three-hand anti-magnetic technician's watch. On the left, Rolex Oyster Perpetual Milgauss 116400 GV, the plank owner of an extraordinary offbeat generation of Rolex technician's watches. And on the right, the 2017 3557 piece limited series Omega Railmaster Trilogy 1957. Oddly enough, this is the younger of the two in the more modern watch, having launched in 2017. We're going to go with the plank owner of the current generation of Rolex Milgauss watches launched in 2007. The GV or the Glace Vert, the green crystal, was a sensation when it bowed back in the 2000s. Weight listed bid up to infinity on secondary markets, and briefly, the hottest new Rolex model. Today, its design has held up considerably compared to what was considered to be a little bit of a shock effect, perhaps a novelty appeal at the time. The watch has actually endured remarkably. It looks as fresh today as it did back in the aughts. Now let's throw it on the wrist. 40 millimeters in diameter on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist. I'm going to give you a wide shot because I know you've been asking for wider shots. The watch is versatile. 13.2 millimeters thick, 49 millimeters lug to lug, 40 millimeters in diameter, but it does have a very distinct look compared to the rotating bezel Rolex sports watches, as well as every Rolex watch with a date. The absence of a cyclops eye, a date window, and a rotating bezel makes this a more viable dress option. So while it's a little bit expressive, extravagant, even extroverted, with that green crystal, the orange accents, and the quirky postmodernist lightning bolt seconds hand, this is still one you can absolutely wear with a business suit or a bathing suit. 20 millimeters is the spacing between the lugs, and you can see that the Oyster bracelet is classical and upscale. This is not an entry-level Rolex, in spite of the lack of a complication or a rotating bezel. You can see the polished center links speak to the level of finish and investment in the model, which retails for $8,200 US dollars and sells for about $7,000 to $7,500 pre-owned. All individual links removable and fixed by screws when they are removable. And you can see that the internals of the clasp are polished, so it's not blasted like the entry-level clasps. You'll also appreciate that there is a easy link system, the equivalent of adding or removing one full-size sizable link, and that is a tool-free system. Also, if you look inside the clasp, you can see there are three anchoring points. If you have a strap tool, you can change the anchoring point of the bracelet to further size down. There's a beacon hook system that fixes this one closed, so though it looks like a clamshell, it is a lift lock release system that is very secure. Oyster style clasp, oyster style bracelet, note the taper, we're going to come back to that. The case band is chunky, but because the watch doesn't feature a rotating bezel, it has a slim profile. 13.2 millimeters and it wears like it, easily sliding underneath the cuff. The dial is different from most Rolex models. First, because it's distinctly matte finished. It's not a black lacquer like most of the sports watches. And second, because it uses differential loom. You can see both a conventional Luminova and an orange variant of the material. You'll see the loom shot. The watch does look different. There's also a combination of white and orange print, as well as that lightning seconds hand. A lot of folks take exception to this, but it's one of the most historically true elements of the watch, as the original Milgauss from 1955 did in fact feature that very same lightning bolt seconds hand, albeit in polished steel. So this is actually a good deal of fidelity to the original. It's where the watch is probably most closely tied to its historical prototype. Now you will note that the timepiece features a green crystal, and this was the showpiece of the original GV back when it bowed in 07. It does not feature the laser engraved Rolex crown at 6 o'clock, the enter county fit counterfeiting measure because it would actually be visible full-time on the green crystal. Inside the case, Rolex 3130 caliber, 48-hour power reserve, free sprung, full balance bridge, anti-magnetic overcoil hairspring, and it is a COSC certified Swiss chronometer with stop seconds and the Rolex superlative chronometer standard, so certified per Rolex to no worse than minus two plus two seconds per day. I should also mention that it features a soft iron inner cage that encompasses the entirety of the movement. So while every Rolex watch today just about features the parachrome blue hairspring, there are a few Siloxis floating around out there, but this is the twin to the Air King, both this and the Air King feature a soft iron inner cage to channel, rather than block magnetic fields, but to channel them around the movement. Now, let's talk about the Challenger. 
Released in 2017, the watch is effectively a throwback to the 1957 CK2914 Railmaster, and this timepiece, featuring everything from the authentic Omega stamp underneath the crystal, which you can see beautifully blazing at center, to a 38 millimeter size that is kinder and gentler than the modern Milgauss, this was a 2017 one of three series, as there were two others. One was the original 57 Speedmaster, the other was a re-edition of the original 1957 Seamaster 300, and between them, they were the trilogy. 3,557 pieces were made of each one, so this watch is a limited edition. You can see that the watch also has a smaller proportion as well as outright dimensions. The watch has a thinner case band, but it's also thinner in an absolute sense, being 12.8 millimeters thick, much of which is that dramatically domed crystal. Lug to lug, it's 48 millimeters versus 49 for the Milgauss, and the lug spacing is 19 millimeters versus 20 for the Milgauss. You'll also note a vintage-inspired straight-link untapered bracelet, as well as a clasp that features a vintage Omega logo dramatically set atop. It is a trigger release system, however, so it has a more sophisticated release system than Rolex's lift lock, and a more sophisticated adjustment system as there's a push button slider inside that gives you 9.7 millimeters of incremental adjustment you see many individual removable links, so you have more fine-tuning potential with this bracelet as there are smaller links and more of them are removable. You can also appreciate the fact that the watch features a dramatically domed and wonderfully distortion-prone crystal, and I say that in endearing terms, because this is a watch that looks the part of a true vintage re-edition. Whereas the Milgauss is modernist, even postmodernist, this one shows extraordinary fidelity to 1957. And that small, one might even say dramatically vintage-inspired hairline case band is probably the dominant feature alongside the bubble-like crystal. And you can see there's only the most minimal of bevels to give it a sharp and distinctly 1950s look right alongside the 1950 style Omega logo, which graces clasp and crown and dial. Now you have a wonderful simulated patina system here that's going to be a love or hate feature. Some folks love Fotina for the warm tones it brings, others hate it as a contrived marketing gimmick. I lie somewhere in between. I, I like it if it looks physically attractive. Here we have a vintage inspired broad arrow hour hand that is Omega's equivalent to the Rolex Lightning Bolt, vintage Omega logo and Omega script, as well as quarter Arabics. Now the watch features a push down crown and 60 meter water resistance, so it's not quite as resilient as the Milgauss. And you can see the case back like the Milgauss is solid with the note that this is the 60th anniversary piece and an individual edition number engraved on the case back. Inside, Silicon hairspring, Mataz chronometer, so timed as a fully cased up watch, anti-magnetic to 15,000 Gauss and beyond, and with a 55 hour to 48 hour power reserve against the Rolex, this one takes the tech title. So let's start with the advantages. First, obviously tech. This is an amagnetic watch. Though it's vintage on the outside, this one's actually more advanced on the inside of R2. You have that extra power reserve of 55 hours to 48. You have the true amagnetic silicon hairspring. You have the coaxial escapement and the exotic independent horology cool that that brings. You also have rarity as a limited edition of 3,500 57 pieces for one model year. These are going to be far less common than a Rolex that's been in production for over a decade and is still in production today. It's also worth mentioning that the watch has a superior clasp. Both the trigger release system, which is a bit more sophisticated and secure, as well as the push button incremental slider. That does give you more flexibility for sizing your watch. Also important to note, this is better for small wrists. 38 millimeters versus 40, 12.8 versus 13.2, and 48 lug to lug versus 50 or 49.9 in the case of the Milgauss. This is just an easier watch to wear if your wrist is under 14 and a half centimeters circumference. I'll also mention elegance. Look at that case band. Compare it to the chunk that is the Milgauss. The Milgauss is a big and burly modern day Rolex case. It's not a super case, but it does have considerable visual mass. Compare the two and you can see that the Rolex got the short and stubby end of the stick when it comes to outright design elegance. I'll also mention that this watch is a perfect candidate for a strap as its vintage look is a better match for an aftermarket or Omega OEM strap option. It would look the business on a NATO, whereas most Rolex watches today in the era of the integrated oyster bracelet only look right aesthetically on a Rolex bracelet. 
Finally, I'm also going to say that there's a potential collection theme here, as you can collect all of the modern Railmasters and make a Railmaster collection, or you can collect the other two watches of the trilogy, the Seamaster and the Speedmaster, and then have the three. So there's a bit of a collection theme here if you want it, and this could be the root of that. Now jumping to the advantages of the Rolex, brand equity. This watch is practically currency, and Rolex, along with Patek Philippe and Richard Mille, the strongest brand names in the watch space right now. Rolex as a name transcends the watch industry. Even my friends who know nothing about watches know Rolex. Also, larger and superior wrist stance. Some people like bigger watches and a watch that has a bigger presence on the wrist. This watch gives you that. It also gives you a color that you don't get with the Omega. 100 meters water resistant with a screw down crown versus 60 meters with a push down crown on the Omega. Also, nuance about the bracelet design. If you look at the bracelet design here, you can see that the polish and taper of the Rolex Oyster is just a bit more graceful than the somewhat less nuanced and admittedly vintage inspired but monotonous design of the Omega bracelet. So I'm actually going to give clasp to the Omega but bracelet design to the Oyster on the Rolex. I'm also going to throw out the fact that this watch is not a rearward looking tribute. Enough with the nostalgia. Let's look forward. Somehow this 2007 Rolex still feels more progressive and ambitious than the 2017 Omega. The retro watch thing has got to end, and the end of the retro watch should and will start with Rolex. I'll also mention that it's a bit of an anti Rolex Rolex. It's the counterculture choice with the color, the quirk, and the charm. So if you're not a Rolex guy, this might be the Rolex for you specifically. And finally, the feel of that bracelet. Not only does it look more finely finished and nuanced in its proportion, but it feels more robust on the wrist. So you guys let me know. Are you going with the straight vintage play of the Trilogy Railmaster, or are you going with the more progressive, modern, and some might even say postmodern colors and character and quirk of the Milgauss? Let me know in the comments below, but I'm going to make my call. I'm a Milgauss man, and when you add a green crystal, that just seals the deal. I like watches that look forward. I like Rolexes that perhaps have a little bit of a reverence and stick it to the typical Rolex brand image and the Rolex brand hubris. This is a watch that isn't afraid to laugh, not just with others, but perhaps even at itself, and I love that. It's the self-effacing Rolex, and it's my choice. A parting shot. The win in the Loom War goes to the Omega Railmaster.